Good afternoon, uh, Luann Brizendine um, is with us today. Uh, she's Luann Brizendine, MD, doctor at, at, at uh, the Women's Mood and Hormone Clinic, the director of that clinic at UCSF, and Lynn and Mark Benioff, uh, chair in psychiatry, uh, endowed chair and clinical professor in the Department of Psychiatry at UCSF. She's also author of the popular books, The Female Brain and The Male Brain. And uh, I've known Luann for years, and um, I've read both her books, and I feel a better person for uh, having learned from her. So, Luann, thank you very much for appearing on Brainwaves today. Well, thank you so much for your support and for inviting me onto your program. Absolutely. It's going to be a good show. So, um, uh, I was st I've just started to reading your books, which are very interesting, by the way. Um, that uh, that all Thank brains. You. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, that all they're brains now, start now in thirty languages, Brandon. Thirty languages and over a million copies worldwide. So that's amazing. It seems to have hit the spot with many people all over the world. Good news. Yeah, they're, they're great books, and they're, they're good introductions to how the brain works, especially how there are differences between male and female brains, which most people don't think too much about. I think. Yeah, and scientists don't either, although there's just been a very large grant given to, down at Stanford to uh, certain researchers to develop between five different departments um, of, in medical school down there for research in specific gender differences in the brain and how that affects um, male and female diseases of the brain. Okay, that is perfect, because I, I was going to ask you a little bit about that. You probably can tell me a bit about that later um, when I get to that question. Um, that's great to know. Uh, oh, and um, so, uh, so it's subtle to read in your books that, that all brains originate looking female, um, but that they begin to diverge at about eight weeks after conception to start, the male brains start looking like male brains, and female brains continue to look like female brains. All right, I think that's the, you know, at the moment of conception, when the sperm that sperm, if it's carrying a Y chromosome, that's going to make a male, uh -huh. and if it's an X, it's going to make a female, I remember. So from the moment of conception, that really makes our, what, what, what whether it's going to be male or female, it makes our sex. Uh -huh. At eight weeks of fetal life, the tiny testicles in the male start to pump out huge amounts of testosterone that marinates the brain, changing the circuitry into male brain. So by the time we're all born, we're either male or female. And then the female brain is actually left unperturbed by testosterone uh -huh. all during nine months of, of gestation. And the female brain is formed when you have no exposure to testosterone okay. when you're in the womb. Okay. Um, so, and then it goes on from there. It's all, so devil, it's all that devil testosterone that does all the... <laughs> That's all the does all the work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you talk about the different hormones in the introduction to your book about like you call testosterone the Zeus for men and uh, as the the, the all powerful um, uh, dominating hormone and so forth. And, and I'm sure you can tell me more about these these hormones as we go through the questions that I have for you. So uh, should be interesting. Um, so uh, let me start out by asking you how did how did you first become interested as a scientist? A scientist and clinician um, in examining and understanding the differences between male and female brains. So of course, you know, we all grow up interested in the opposite sex, or if you're going to end up, being, you know, being same sex attracted, your sexual orientation is going to be the same sex. That all kind of that unfolds during our teenage years. So we we all get interested in sex and sex differences in in our at least by our teens or mid teens. And for me, I was an undergraduate at UC Berkeley in the time when all of my professors that I was taking in my neurobiology courses were the um, sort of the the leaders of the field of sex differences and sexual behaviors being stimulated by the hormones. So the knowledge about a male sexual behavior and the hormone testosterone was being worked out at that time in the 70s. And so I basically, you know, when you're a 19, 20 year old undergraduate, like at UC Berkeley, I just assumed that this was what everybody knew and how I started looking at the world that way. And so hormones and behavior became a very interesting topic to me from that period in time. And then as I went on to Yale to do my medical school, um, people weren't as interested then in the, the hormones. As a matter of fact, I didn't necessarily know at the time that those professors I had there at UC Berkeley were the 
the founders of this whole field of hormones and behavior, hormones and sexuality. And um, basically it took many years for me as I went to get my psychiatric training to loop back around to bringing the hormones into the field of psychiatry. So in 1993, I started a clinic and a seminar called Hormones in Psychiatry at UCSF. And that was the beginning of my sort of professional uh, track in this area. Okay. And um, uh, so and your career has developed into not only being a psychiatrist that understands these differences, but also um, into a writer about these, these differences. And, and as you write in your books, excuse me, um, one thing you've discovered and that you know about is that females are about twice as likely as males to develop um, depression at some point in their lives. And uh, I know you have some ideas about why this might be the case. Um, can you share with us a bit about why you think that is? Yeah. So indeed, that was that was what I got very interested in as a medical student as I started doing my psychiatry rotations uh, in my third year of medical school at Yale was uh, a time when, uh, of course, in reading and diving deeper in that time, which was in the um, late 70s, early 80s, about um, the two to one in depression in females versus males. I thought that was sort of a dirty deal. <laughs> yeah. You know, being female myself and watching females become more depressed. And, of course, to this day in all the cultures around the world, I mean, I thought having been raised in the, you know, in the feminist movement in Berkeley in the 1970s that it probably was the oppressive patriarchy making women more depressed and, you know, it, that it was probably something to do with the social, cultural, political context, uh, which of course part of it is any any group that's sort of an out group gets you know more stress. So I think women do get more stress in a lot of ways in our culture, but that's not the whole picture. So this two to one ratio and how that does not start, by the way, until uh, about twelve or thirteen years old in girls at the age when the menstrual period starts. And so no one was looking at the fact that in childhood, the ratio of depression in childhood depression to male to female is one to one. And it doesn't start to split off until between like 12 and 15 years old during the teenage years as the menstrual cycle starts going. Females tend to get more depression, two to one ratio. And anxiety disorders, a four to one ratio, more anxiety disorders wow. in, uh, in females. So, you know, males get more back on the other end of more learning disabilities. If you look at autism spectrum disorders, now abbreviated ASD, autism spectrum disorders are up to 16 to 1 or 8 wow. to 1 ratio in male over female. So we have to be clear that there are really big, robust gender differences in neuropsychiatric disorders that we know about, and it's being under-researched um, at this point. Okay. Um, well, with that in mind, uh, uh, why are there so few gender-specific therapies for psychiatric disorders like depression or anxiety or, or autism or schizophrenia? So one of the things that we know in medicine is that, um, uh, and I'll tell you a story, Brendan, when I was uh, in, in medical school at Yale, I can remember that the professor had talked about this, this great study and, and all of the interesting parts about this study. And I raised my hand and I said, you know, what, what, are the, what, were, what were your findings in the females? He says, oh, well, we don't study the females. The menstrual cycle will just mess up the data. <laughs> and, but as a 23-year-old medical student, I felt like, Oh, oh, no, you wouldn't want to mess up your data. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you say, huh? So, uh, you know, you, you, buy, you buy into the cultural context, even in the scientific world. If, it, if nobody thinks you want to mess up your data by studying the females, and that's still true to this day. Men, most of the studies that come out, even today in psychiatric studies that are looked at in animal studies, they don't use female animals. It's mostly, mostly all males. Okay. So, um... I may have lost track now of your question, but I, I hope that helps to answer the, the, the where we are currently in not really having anything gender specific in terms of treatments for neuropsychiatric disorders for female versus male. It's because we don't know enough of the basic biology about that. I think it's time we get started on moving the, moving the ball forward in that arena because 
if you think about it, one of the easiest things to know about your patient when you look at them is what, what their sex is. Yeah. If you had something that was crafted more to that person's genes, i.e. male or female genes, you may be able to take a slightly different path. We do know things like, you know, schizophrenia is a 1.4 to 1 ratio more male than female. And then if you look at bipolar, it happens to be 1 to 1. So there's, there, throughout the neuropsychiatric world, there's, and in Parkinson's disease, if you look at neurological disorders, that's more prevalent in male than in female. If you look at Alzheimer's, it's got more in female. So something about what what your sex, you know, every cell, think about it, every cell in your body, including your stem cells, all of your cells are either male or female cells. Okay, if, yeah. You know what you, so my body has all, it's got all female cells. Yeah. There's no male cells. As the... Actual. All male cells. So it's not a huge difference in the cell in terms of percentage of your DNA in your cell, but it is, it is a difference. It seems to... Be rather significant if you think that that difference in that cell is what makes the genitalia different the most obvious piece that it's really significant neurodeve- neurodevelopmentally so why do more boys get autism um, why do more boys get um, learning disabilities why do more girls end up getting depression and anxiety and mostly during their fertile years of the menstrual cycle once you hit age 50 52 females and males go back to closer to one to one actually uh-huh. they think that males depression increases a little bit at that stage and females comes down so that's why they get closer so you know that the devil's always in the details in, in science you know but that's just looking at the big piece so you're correct how you approach as a clinician your patient, the first thing that you see is, is what sex they are and how to, how to, to tailor these things to uh, the genders in terms of their uh, medications and their presentation. And if we knew more about that, which we don't yet, but if, when, we, when we do more about that, we will be able to tailor it more specifically to that person. Excellent. That that will definitely be a help. So, um, you know, it, on, on another slightly different but related topic, it's been shown that oxytocin therapy can help uh, patients with autism spectrum disorders and also schizophrenia in their social cognitive abilities. Uh, in preliminary results from a couple of studies that I've seen, um, and you write about oxytocin in your books and what it does. Can you maybe explain a bit about how? you think that therapy might help social cognition? In, in so oxytocin, of course. Let's tell our audience. First of all, oxy, yeah. it's oxytocin, not oxycontin. It's oxytocin, <laughs> okay. which is, you know, a neuropeptide that acts like it is a hormone in the brain, and it's mostly made in, in little cells in the hypothalamus, the oxytocin is made. And its main activity is to cause smooth muscles to squeeze. So, for example, um, it's the hormone that squeezes the baby out when you go into labor and delivery. So, actually, there's a synthetic oxytocin called pitocin that lots of women get when they go into labor. It makes the contraction stronger to squeeze the baby out when you're delivering a baby. It also is what squeezes the milk out of the glands to feed the baby, to breastfeed the baby. It's also what squeezes the sperm out during ejaculation. So it's, it's the smooth, it's the, so that's what we know it does to, to the body and the smooth muscles in the body in those particular glands. So it's really very, very important to sexual function and to labor and delivery and birth. So it has a lot to do with the procreation of the species, right? Uh-huh. Uh, in both male and female. But we also know that the brain releases a lot of this. Of course, the brain is where it's mostly made. And that it has, um, it increases feelings of, of, of love and attachment and bonding. So it's kind of called one of the parenting hormones. It's one of the things that, um, it's, called, it's, it's dubbed, been dubbed the love hormone. You've probably heard that, right? It's been dubbed the love hormone. Yeah. And you, one of the ways you can get it to release in humans is it's this certain 
um, stroking, like a mother stroking the head of a baby, or how you kind of sometimes stroke your dog, you know, or something. Uh-huh. But it, it's it has something to the the, the brain re- reads this as kind of the the signal of love and care and TLC, and it will release oxytocin. So if you do a massage therapy to specifically release oxytocin, you can do that. Now we learn to give it to people, you know, in labor and delivery, we give it through the, we give it intravenously, so we give it through an IV, but you're not going to give it to humans IV, (laughs) but there now is a form of it that you can use as a nasal spray. It goes straight pretty much into the brain. Um, You can get it up there through the nasal spray, oxytocin nasal spray. I think it costs about $800 a vial or something. Been used in research, and you can also buy smaller amounts on the internet. It's it's everywhere now. Oxytocin is now a something that's out there in the world. Um, females make a lot more of it than males. Estrogen is one of the things that that makes those little cells in the brain make a lot of oxytocin. But of course, males have a lot of estrogen in their body too. You know that testosterone gets converted into estrogen by uh, an enzyme called aromatase. It sounds like a coffee bean, aromatase, but it's <laughs> called aromatase. It takes testosterone and it changes it into estrogen. Males have a lot of aromatase. You guys have a lot of aromatase in all the cells in your body. So you're always making a lot of estrogen out of your testosterone. So your brain is also making a fair amount of, of oxytocin. Anyway, so it's been used in, it's been tried quite a number of years in different ways to be used in schizophrenia, but also in autism, um, to try to stimulate the um, empathy and attachment systems in the brain. Um, I would say that the studies that are out now make it a compound, oxytocin is a compound of interest, wouldn't you, from what you've read? It's a compound of interest in terms of how it will really turn out to be used therapeutically. I don't think we quite know yet, but it's worth having something else there. It's always going to be a difficulty. I guess you could just snort a couple of snorts of it every morning or a couple times a day, right? It's not a, it's the drug delivery system that's caused it to be difficult to study and it's expense right now, but um, I think it it has some interesting therapeutic uh, results, which sort of increases interest in attachment, interest in people. It doesn't last very long, but I think, I I agree with you, Brennan, it's it's an area of of interest, it's an interesting compound. Yeah, it's um, it's primarily in an experimental stage right now for use as a therapy, Um, just let our viewers know that, but um, but yeah, it definitely looks like something that could potentially help people in the future. Right, and I think one of the, you know, and, you know, one of the best ways to you know, we release lots of chem- neurochemicals and hormones just when we're in the presence of another person, kind of the face-to-face interaction. And so, actually, maybe one of the ways psychotherapy or talk therapy also helps to work is that, you know, it may release hormones like oxytocin in our systems, or it may, you know, it, it, it really, it, it, cognitive behavioral therapy, you know, there's lots of ways or... The, the new kind of neural reprogramming computer systems may help us use different circuits differently. And one of the hypotheses is that, that that may help us release different hormones in our brain, like oxytocin. Okay. That. Wow. So that's fascinating. So um, as you say, uh, phys- emotional um, social contact with uh, other people uh, is a oxyto- can be an oxytocin releaser. Um, do you, um, a calm, loving family environment in general would probably be a good environment for somebody with mental illness to live in. Um, now, do you have any recommendations based on that idea um, for parents of kids with mental illness or, or at risk with, for mental illness or potentially partners of people who have mental illness? Well, I think you bring up a really important area that we've known in how to create the most successful environment for people with all kinds of mental illness. And that is um, something that also works in normal people when they get really stressed out. You know, the, the, the stress hormones like cortisol and, you know, once you 
what, if you think of a seesaw, right, once those stress hormones go up, sometimes other things go down. Your, your, ability to, your ability to function and your cognition go down when the stress hormones go up for, for every, brain, every person's brain. Different brains have a way to metabolize that, right? So people with mental illness don't kind of rebalance that very quickly. So the, one of the attempts is to keep the stress level basically down um, at a, the stress level down at a, some functional uh, level that helps us not overreact or helps you be able to stay in a loving family environment, as you say, to keep people uh, um, not going off the off-ramp to stability, right? So if you think about what you would like for someone in your family or your community or your loved one to keep, the, um, to keep their mental illness in as easy balance as possible, you don't want a high amount of like emotional stress, right? You don't want a high amount of physical stress. You don't want that person to have to use, you want things to be kind of organized for that person as much as possible so that on days when they don't feel like they can do as much, there's a system to kind of help them with that. On days when they can do more, then, then they have the, uh, the freedom to do that. It's, it's, it's a delicate balance for each family. And I know, as you know, in your lifetime, Brandon, you, at different times of your illness, you needed different amounts of, of support for balance and stress. Would you say that's your experience? Yes, I was going to mention that after you were done with what you were just saying. Um, when I was uh, pretty sick back in the, the mid-90s when I first met you, and you, you helped uh, uh, advise my mom and dad on um, uh, how, how to put some structure in place for me, um, and uh, and such, uh, and that helped a lot having the structure there um, to keep myself uh, engaged and um, and as you say, staying on a good path for stability. Right, and I think that the the psychiatric medications that we have these days, as you've experienced, you have to keep tweaking them for the individual until you can find a balance that allows the person to treat the illness but not to decrease their uh, ability to be their best self. Mm-hmm. Would that be your experience? Yeah, that's definitely true. Um, when I was uh, t- uh, titrating my medications with my psychiatrist, uh, we tried different doses until we found the ones that worked best. And I- I've been on the same cocktail for the last uh, eight years and not doing fine. So I guess we found a good balance for now. Uh, so your next book that you're working on now, The Love Brain, uh, uh, I understand that's coming along. And uh, what, what will it cover different from your previous two books uh, relative to the biology of love? Well, it's, uh, basically it's actually going to be a bit about how all of the the hormones and the neurochemicals of, of love and attachment, and I talk about that in the female brain in chapter six, the female brain and emotions, and also then in the male brain, the chapter on the emotions of manhood. You know, there there are slight differences in those those circuits and the way we express things, and probably originating, by the way, from uh, the amount of testosterone or estrogen we have every day in our in our bloodstream. Um, I learned something interesting recently, Brandon, I was asked to give a talk at the um, at the student union at UC Berkeley, my alma mater, and uh, the uh, gender equities uh, lecture series, and they asked me to come be their keynote lecturer, so I gave a talk uh, last year there, and then after the talk, uh, a group of young people came up to me and I was signing some books and there was one person talking to me and and a little while uh, sort of a uh, a sort of thin Asian fellow was talking to me says oh I'm so glad I can tell that you're treating me like I'm male (laughs) and I spent a couple hours after talking with, with him and several other people that were there, but he's basically gone from being female to male. He's in the oh. middle of the transition and had just gone to the male clothing. And, and, and of course, being small, 
Asian, you know, the facial hair was not, you know, it's, it's, I think that with less facial hair for Asians, it made it easier uh, for him. But my point here is that he, he was telling me that he, what he's most amazed about is that when he was female, before he started taking the daily testosterone that he takes to support his lower voice and his, you know, going the male direction, he's um, now taking 50 milligrams of testosterone now for the last six or eight months. He says, the thing I noticed the most is when I was female, every, all my friends used to come to talk to me about their problems. And I would listen for hours and try and help them figure out all their emotional problems. He says, now I've been taking this testosterone. I don't want to hear any of it. I just <laughs> Show. <laughs> so what you say in your books is true, and and based on that 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 uh, that uh, example of that young gentleman you spoke with, that's pretty amazing to have that confirmation for you right there. The, the robustness of our sex hormones in terms of our even what we think about, even what we find interesting, even whether we want to talk about the emotions with somebody else or we just want to get on with it, you know. Uh, it's, it's interesting to see them have these robust behavioral effects in all of us. So that I find that still to this day, that's what I find most interesting about the work I do is the amazing behavioral effects in all of us that, that our hormones have that we may not even know. I see most men walk around with testosterone levels between 400 and 1,000, you know, when they're young. And you guys don't think anything about it. You just, it's just. <laughs> <laughs> well, vive la différence, right? Evil a difference. That's what I've got to say. Thank goodness that there's the, the differences. So yeah. Well, thank you very much, Luann. This has been an enlightening and fun talk, and uh, I, I think that our viewers will have some questions for you that they'll post online after I post this, this video online. Are you ready when this is posted to answer some questions for them? Sure, I'd be happy to answer some questions. So just bring them on. I'm happy to uh, take all comers, whatever question you find that you want to ask. But uh, so thank you. Brandon, for all of the support of the uh, of Emro and uh, the Staglin Family Foundation, etc., we have been really uh, happy recipients at the Women's Mood and Hormone Clinic at UCSF for my program and uh, the male and female brain differences. So I appreciate all of your support. You're so welcome, and uh, so thanks, Glenn, again. And uh, I'll, I'll give you a call at, um, in just a moment to, to go over this, but we'll talk to you soon. Okay, thank all you. Right. Bye bye now. Bye bye.